Now, where are we in this? We're saying here is this, as you say, wow story of what Jesus does with the man who has a legion of demons affecting his life and dominating his personality. Uh, that's not just arising in a vacuum. We've been noticing over the last few weeks that what's happening in this section of Mark's Gospel is that Jesus has been saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, you must all repent and believe the Gospel and show that by following me, and by following me you will become fishers of men. And then having said you're going to become fishers of men by repenting and following me, he appoints 12 apostles to lead that initiative of taking his word into the world, which is what following him as a disciple of his is about. And as soon as he appoints those 12, you get the opposition from his family. That, that would surely be unexpected and unwelcome and very upsetting. And then you get opposition from the religious leaders. And given what you're trying to do, surely that would be difficult, upsetting and, you know, a, a stress to you. And then his family come back and have another go. So there's this opposition. And against that pattern of opposition, Jesus teaches his followers who to go out and tell this gospel and preach this coming gospel of the incoming kingdom. He tells them what sort of responses they're going to get to the preaching of the kingdom of God and how they should respond to that. So the parable of the sower says, this range of responses is what you should expect when following me you become a fisher of men and tell the word of the kingdom coming in. The, the sower sows his seed and he gets lots of different responses from different sorts of soil. Expect that. And then you get this parable of the lamp that says, look, just because you're getting a bad response, don't fail to put the word in, on public display. And then you get this one about the seed growing secretly. You, you're working hard, you're, you're spreading, you're sharing your faith, you're preaching the gospel of the incoming kingdom of God, that people should repent and, and believe the gospel. You're doing all that and it looks like nothing's happening. Yeah, ever been there? But actually, what's happening is that seed is growing in the ground. And underground, that soil is being changed. And then the mustard seed. Love that one. That's come back to me a few times this week with various things going on. Um, you know, a tiny, tiny thing. It looks like a tiny thing. You've said a small thing to somebody. You've, you've shared some aspect of Christian truth with somebody relevant to some part of their life or whatever it happens to be. It feels like you've done nothing. And Jesus says, ah, oh, no, no, no. That little thing that you've done is like a tiny, tiny seed that goes into the ground and, and grows away quietly. And by the end of its process, there's a, a bush that's big enough for who to come and nest in? The birds of the air. And what's relevant about the birds of the air? What birds are they? They're wild birds. I knew Mike could get that first of all. Loves the wild birds. I love the what? Hang on, we better watch what we're saying there. Um, loves the people who are far from. So that they can come and find rest. Those guys. Guys and gals, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. So Jesus has now shown us the power of the word. It looks like nothing. It grows away secretly and all that sort of stuff. The word of the kingdom as it comes in. But then he says, ah, oh, but it's the word of this Lord. Right. What sort of Lord? The one who has this level of authority. The one who crosses the lake in a boat. And the sea, which you know, it, it has, as we were saying, it, it represents the forces of cosmic chaos in the ancient Near East. Okay? The forces of cosmic chaos try to overcome and to put to death the Son of God who's come to bring in his kingdom. And he stands up and he says, shh, get down. Right? The way you would to a naughty dog. Be quiet, get down, and they do. That's his authority. That's the level of authority he has over cosmic chaos. And the next bit of cosmic chaos is the passage that we're coming at today, which you'll be very pleased about, because it means we're that bit closer to lunch when I say things like that. Okay, so now we're looking at this driving out of the, 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 the demons from this guy. Jesus and the disciples have been in the storm on the lake at night. Remember that? Storm at night on the lake. Crossing the storm at night, they're obviously going to feel pretty drained by the time they get to the other side after he's still the storm and they've rowed on over. Two hour crossing, uh, they're obviously going to be feeling quite tired and possibly quite emotional. It's been a night. We're not told when they turn up. My best guess is they turn up on the shore at this particular location fairly early in the next day and they immediately walk into this situation. They've surely had enough, you know. They've had the storm on the lake, boys. That's, that's enough to be going on with this week, isn't it, boss? No, 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 actually. Look what's coming down the beach. Look what's coming at you down the beach. The disembarkation point, <coughs> excuse me, need more tea, is identified as the region of the Gerasenes. Now, that's an interesting one. Um, the consensus seems to be that this is, therefore, somewhere in the region of the modern town of Kursa, or Grasa. Uh, at that site, there is a level shore 
So you can come up on the shore. It's not a cliff to land on. It's a shore, so you can land your boat. But there are no tombs. But if you go about a mile south, there's a fairly steep slope. It's 40 yards back from the modern shore. And uh, about two miles from there, there are cavern tombs that have been found which have signs of human habitation. So we're in the region. Do you get it? We're in that area of the modern town of, of, of Kersa. This is not Israel. They've come across the lake. They are now in pagan territory. In this, say again, like us. <laughs> Hence the pigs. Hence the pigs. Hence the pigs. Uh, come into that, pigs. Don't rush the pigs. They'll rush themselves. Um, <laughs> it's not Israel. It's pagan lands, okay? And in these places, children are dedicated to pagan deities from birth onwards. People practice rituals and observance that's abhorrent to the Jews, it's pagan idolatry type stuff. And the Gerasenes are therefore opening up their lives on a, a, an everyday basis to evil, as a matter of course. They're opening themselves up to this stuff. And there were always going to be consequences of such a lifestyle. But the man who meets Jesus really is a stark example of that. Extremely stark example. Look at what he's like. They've entered the enemy's enclave. Just as Jesus was getting out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came from the tombs and met him. He lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For his hands and feet had often been bound with chains and shackles, but he'd torn the chains apart and broken the shackles in pieces. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And each night... And every day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he'd cry out and cut himself with, himself with stones. Now, we, we tend to look at sort of mental health services in, in our culture and era as being, you know, perhaps not what we'd wish they were going to be. But in those days, if you had somebody who was sadly, you know, way off his chump like this, you'd get hold of him and you'd tie him up. Not that, not that long ago, really, that was the case in this country. And they'd tie him up and they'd been trying to catch him and tie him up and all the guys of the village no doubt would turn out and then the nearby town they'd all turn out and jump on him and you know try and grab him and tie him and okay boys chains and shackles this time no good because there's this destructive strength in the guy the guy is uh, a set of d's there you go dangerous <laughs> dangaroos um, this guy comes out of his richly unclean dwelling and he's indwelt by this unclean spirit and he's unrestrainably violent unutterably strong and due to his continuing to be on the loose because nobody can bind him he is an ongoing danger and a threat it's like having a bear loose He's an ongoing danger and an ongoing threat, not only to himself, but to everybody else. Except Jesus. Isn't that incredible? The preacher. Dangerous and distressing. Because, <laughs> seeing this sort of thing, it's distressing. He lived in the tombs. It's not nice to see somebody living like that. He wandered in the hills. Just wandered. You see people sometimes just, just out of their wits wandering. He cut himself, and that's that's been so much in the news, but this is not this is not like self-harming type stuff, the stuff we read about in the magazines and stuff. He he cut himself so that he cried out. Crying out, odd, unnatural behaviour. And it's disturbing, isn't it? A prospect of humanity degraded by its devotion to and by its capture by evil. Now, okay, maybe he's got himself into a position and he's exposed himself to this sort of thing and he's, he's in a situation. But, you know, the situation that he's in, the responsibility rests with the demons who've taken possession and, and overcome the centre of his personality and destroyed him. And it's distressing, isn't it? And he's degraded. 
It's dangerous, it's distressing, it's degrading. This guy's made to be in the image of God. You know? And look what's happened. Everyone's scared of this guy, but it's not because he's more of a man because of his strength. It's because he's less of a man because he's overcome. He's degraded. But this encounter with Jesus makes the spiritual, in fact, the cosmic significance of his symptoms absolutely clear. Here is a person who's made to be in the image of God and his life has been degraded by being overcome by evil. Dangerous, distressing, degrading and destructive. This is what the forces of darkness do to a human personality. It's destructive. It's, uh, it's knocked into bits. The abiding impression of this man as Jesus finds him is that this man has not only lost his God-given autonomy as one made to be in the image of God, but he is under the powerful control of powerful forces that are bent on his destruction. And we will see how destructive those can be when they come to the pigs. The business of the enemy of souls is not social work. Yeah? The business of the enemy of souls is the destruction of human personality. And it's all very well in our modern age for us to talk about, you know, people's lifestyle choices and faith positions and belief and all the rest of it. Guys, that's not his business. This is the business that he's in. Being permissive of the devil doing his life's work of destruction is at least unwise for a Christian, isn't it? And bear in mind, people in that situation can't always make the choices they would want to. And as with this man, they're not always expressing their own actual interests or their own personal wishes at all. And they can do that quite forcefully. Okay, well, we, we've, we've got as far as verse 6, and uh, we've set the scene. We've had to set the scene. that The narrative, sort of, the story has sort of slowed down a bit, because uh, Jesus and the boys turn up on the beach, right? And then there's this all, all this explanation about this guy, which we need, because we haven't got the background. We've had that, and now we're back into the narrative uh, line again of the story. We've got the background, and uh, here we are. The man sees Jesus from a distance. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. It's all surprises today, isn't it? He ran and bowed down before Jesus. And then he cried out with a loud voice. We're used to that, but not this. Leave me alone, Jesus, son of the most high God. I implore you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said, Jesus had taken the initiative with this guy. This guy hadn't asked for this. Jesus had taken the initiative. Jesus had said to him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And then there's the destructive bit with the pigs. The man sees Jesus from a distance and runs up to Jesus, who does not do what anyone else would have done, which would be to get back in the boat and clear off pretty sharpish. And then he falls at Jesus' feet in kind of worship or kind of recognition of who Jesus is. It stops short of worship, doesn't it? Everyone petrified of this wild, blood-stained, tomb-dwelling character. And Jesus stands there as the guy approaches. We're not told how the disciples felt about this. That could be quite instructive, couldn't it? Boss, are you sure about this? You know, there's a boat, like, you know? I had a situation this week where somebody had a dog running loose down the street, and I was out with Daisy on the front of the house. And this was sort of a, a cross Alsatian in more than one way. This Alsatian was a cross Alsatian. And... Uh, <clears throat> came bounding across and he was taking no note and he broke and called his dog and I called Daisy in and Daisy was in the house like zoom, uh, in the house and this thing just kept coming at me so I went back in the house and slammed the door in his face and I got in just in time and that was great <clears throat> they could have gone and got out of the situation of difficulty and danger and avoided it they could have got on the boat and gone Jesus stands there and says come on let's deal with you the authority of the guy is immense that appearance, that threatening, advancing presence of the enemy of souls and the hounds of hell is all it often takes to get most of us back on the boat and standing out away from the shore. And if we do that, we will not see what the disciples saw that day, which is the immense power of God to redeem 
to ransom and redeem. See, we've got every biblical warrant to flee temptation, but we have no biblical warrant to flee the threatening, the scary advance of the enemies of God because it is the kingdom of God that's advancing and they only look as if they are. Do you see what I mean? Is that making sense? Is this English? Have I put you all to sleep? More tea. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so these things, living in this guy, however that works, they all know all too well who Jesus is. And they start this piteous campaign. His family don't know who he is. The religious leaders don't know who he is. We saw that back in chapter 3, 13 to 35. But the forces of darkness are absolutely clear about who Jesus is and about the extent of his authority and about the purpose of his mission on earth. This is fire on their skin. What these demons can't abide is the loving kindness, is the grace of God the Father wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ on his rescue mission and the gospel, the message that goes with that, the gospel of the kingdom of God. They can't abide that. See, the thing is, the establishment of the kingdom of God is directly a matter of the disestablishment of the kingdom of darkness, isn't it? Does that make sense? It's threatening, isn't it? You can understand that. They're going to be rattled, aren't they? And the poor guy's going to be stuck with it. If God's kingdom's coming forward, then the kingdom of darkness is going backwards. And that's what Mark told us right back at the beginning that the message of Jesus is all about. The demons inhabiting this guy, they've got nowhere to run because the kingdom of God is coming in. They've got nowhere to go, so they come towards the king. Who's bringing in that kingdom? And they make these pathetic sounding pleas for mercy. Leave me alone, Jesus, son of the most high God. I implore you by God, do not torment me. They know all too well who Jesus is. They know all too well what Jesus is there for. There's all this thing about knowing the name and having power over and all the rest of it. They're trying to have power over Jesus by knowing his name and stuff like that. But, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's Jesus who does the name thing. It's Jesus who says, who are you? My name is Legion, for we're many. There are many of us. Ah, oh, Legion's an answer that quite a lot of commentaries argue about. There's lots written about it. But what we're really told is, is what we really need to know, you know. We're told what the significance of legion is, it's because we're many. This guy's got a multiple problem. What are they concerned about, these, these demons? This is interesting, verse 10. He begged Jesus repeatedly not to send them out of the region. Which region? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever wondered about that? I've got a very odd suggestion to make to you. Well, it's not odd. It's genius, I made it. Um, so, so um, yeah, okay. Just see if you like it or not. I don't know. <clears throat> I haven't read this in any book. I've, prayed and meditated and studied scripture. Um, <clears throat> he begged Jesus repeatedly not to send them out of the regions. Verse 10. Meta auta apostele echo tes choras. Chora. Cheora. It's the space lying between two places or two limits. It, it's a region or a country tract of land between things. It, it's the rural region sort of outside a city or village. The region sort of between the Net Bible notes say, feminine of a derivative of the base, something through the idea of empty expanse, room, a space, a space. There's this space thing coming back all the time, not outer space, you know, an intermediate zone. Don't send us out of that intermediate zone. Now, now here are these things and they're in the guy, right? And uh, where they're going is they're going to eternal lostness, ultimately. But there's this idea that they're getting thrown out of there and into the intermediate zone. And can you think of a Bible passage already? Uh, Jesus in Luke 11, 24, very similar to Matthew 12, where he says the same sort of thing. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and doesn't find it, and then it says, I'll return to the house I left. Interesting, isn't it? Is that what Legion is asking for? Is it possible that Legion is asking that the exorcism should drive them out to wander and return, either to this man or someone else, rather than be consigned directly to everlasting punishment? 
Don't cast me out of that intermediate zone where I can get back at somebody else again. Now that, that throws a lot of light on what's going to happen next with the pigs. Can I come off my notes a minute? <clears throat> There's this idea going around in the ancient world, in the, well, in the first century Palestine, that, that the way to really get rid of demons is to drown them. Yeah? Because then they won't be floating around in that intermediate zone anymore and able to get back to somebody else. And they beg to go out into this herd of pigs, which is grazing on the... Grazing? Pigs? Interesting. On the hillside... And they go straight into that place that there's no return from, from these forces of darkness. Now, that's just putting two and two together and getting a picture. But there was that idea going round, and certainly a lot of pigs died. And it was in water. There you go. Pay your money, take your choice. Don't send us out of that place where we can sort of get back at someone else later. You know, don't, don't consign us to perdition and lostness straight away. And Jesus says... They say, let us go in the pigs, let us enter them. So Jesus gave permission. So the unclean spirits came out, verse 13, went into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep slope into the lake and about 2,000 were drowned in the lake. The 20th and 21st centuries spend more time worrying about the death of these slaughter pigs than they do about the miraculous liberation of a deeply demonized and tortured soul, right? From this pagan land of the Decapolis and the authority of the Son of God that's seen in those things. Uh, I'm sorry for the pigs. I'm sorry about the pigs. Incidentally, there's a strong suggestion that this many pigs could only be supplying the Roman legions in Palestine. But that's another thing to think about, perhaps this afternoon as you're driving away or as you're sitting in your deck chair or whatever you're doing later on. The story... Go on, go on. You making plans for the afternoon? That's fine. <laughs> New line of sea. Well... I've, I've been in abattoirs that kill 2,000 pigs a day. And here we are worrying about 2,000 once on one day a long time ago. It was a large herd. And that's why they're saying possibly, you know, the only sort of accumulation of peoples, possibly the legion and it's being kept for the legion. And we don't know that. What the story is trying to tell us, to return to the point, is the immense authority of the king over the kingdom. The authority of Jesus, the destructiveness of these hosts, forces of darkness, the clear indication that Jesus' real message is, for the, is, is genuine and the kingdom of God drives out the kingdom of darkness and it's coming in before everyone's eyes. Now you can see why in the structure of the, of the book so far as we've shown it, that's what Jesus is trying to do. Animal welfare is certainly not the concern of the people of that region. They had these pigs not as pets. It raises an issue for our 21st century people. My suggestion is we should be concerned about welfare of animals all the time. Um, but certainly I've seen bigger abattoirs than that handling more pigs than that a day. And... Uh, Animal welfare is not the concern of this story. Human welfare is. And it's a different thing. So responses to all of that. <sighs> Rattled by redemption, verses 14 to 20. The, uh, the herdsmen were apparently tending these pigs when the evil spirits came into them and drove them off the cliff. How did they respond? These herdsmen, and it, it tends not to be the most timid and quiet of souls that herd pigs. Um, I've, I've shown pigs, you know, one at a time, generally. Uh, it's always better that way. Um, you've probably seen us showing pigs at the Kent and stuff, and the kids growing up showing pigs. Uh, certainly when it comes to showing male pigs, um, you know, you've got to be over 21, you've got to have a board and a bat, and there's got to be two of you on each beast. Uh, that's, that's, not for, that's not for show. <laughs> that's, for, that's needed. Um, and it, it's one of the most exciting things I used to do when I was living up in Kent. And I used to love showing pigs, showing boars. There was one guy I'd show boar with because we trusted one another and we looked after one another. It was great. Um, you don't tend to get the most timid of people looking after pigs because they ain't like that. 
So these herdsmen and these pig herdsmen out in the open, tending these pigs, the evil spirits came into them and drove their, their pigs right off the cliff. Now here's their response. Now the herdsmen ran off and spread the news in the town and countryside. Two things, they ran off. Secondly, they spread the news all over the place. Um, so, so you've got these tough guys who first of all run off and secondly, they're talking God everywhere. Something big's happened, yeah? They saw the mighty works of God and their response was to get scared. But in their scaredom, they told everyone what had happened. <laughs> you know about that, don't you? When you have a scared response, you chatter. None of their knowledge is going to save them. None of that is going to save them. They're primarily scared of the power of Jesus. They're secondly talking the shock out of their system, but they have not themselves turned from sin to the Saviour and been saved. Painfully easy to be scared by the reality of Christ and his kingdom. This is for real. Things happen that you cannot explain when you walk with God. Painfully easy, though, to be scared by the reality of Christ in his kingdom, even to talk the stress of his authority out of your system, but not to repent and be saved. Now, as they were talking, the townspeople were listening. So there's another group. What sort of response are they going to make? We know what the herdsmen did. What about the townspeople? Well, the, the townspeople thought, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Let's go and have a look. So, you know, you get this opposite response to the same thing. Oh, let's have a look. And off they go to have a look. Perhaps they're thinking, well, the pigs will be in the water now anyway, so it's safe enough. I don't know. And over they go. The people went out to see what had happened, verse 14. They came to Jesus and they saw the demon-possessed man sitting there, clothed in his right mind, the one who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Now, why are they afraid? Those who had seen what had happened to the demon-possessed man reported it. They also told about the pigs. And then they began to beg Jesus to leave their region. The people heard the startled accounts of the frightened herdsmen. They were curious to see what had happened. They did not end up saved. They ended up scared. They weren't scared of the demons and the pigs. This group were terrified when they saw the demon-possessed man sitting there clothed and in his right mind, the one who'd had the legion, and then they were afraid by the redeeming power of God and the big change in a wild man. They saw the evidence of the change in the man and they were afraid. It is not the mere reality of spiritual things that rattles these people. It is the reality of Christ's redemption and Christ's restoration of unlikely characters. God doing what is miraculous through Jesus. And it was that which set them begging Jesus to leave their region. The sheer reality of a life radically changed by God. And they couldn't live with it. And it was fire on their skin. And they wanted no more to do with Jesus. That's scary stuff. Two reactions, herdsmen, townspeople, and the man. The reaction of the redeemed man himself. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed asked if he could go with him. And the expression there is one of wishing to become a follower, a disciple of a rabbi. Can I come with you? Can I be with you? But Jesus did not permit him to do so. No, you cannot. You'd have thought this guy would be an ideal convert. I mean, he's a living illustration of the power of the incoming kingdom of God. Sometimes you meet people like this. They've had radical conversion experiences and, you know, they're toted around by, by travelling preachers like they're a monkey on a chain for the entertainment of the masses, you know? No, he says. Do this. Go to your home and to your people and tell them what the Lord has done for you, that he had mercy on you. The guy's a Gentile guy. The guy's a pagan guy. Go back to your pagan people. Tell them. 
So he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him and all were amazed. What are the characteristics of those who turn from sin and trusted Christ because the kingdom of God's coming in? They become followers of Jesus and they become, as a result of becoming followers, they become disciples. Yeah, that, that, being a follower and a disciple, the, the language is the same. But if you become a follower of Jesus, what do you do? You fish. Men. And what's he doing? We're being told things that show us this guy's become a follower of Jesus. With the same consequences for this Gentile guy of being a follower of Jesus as for the Jewish guys on the other side of the lake he's been dealing with up until now. So the mission amongst the Gentiles is going to have the same fruit and consequence as the mission amongst the Jews. This is the Messiah bringing in Jews and Gentiles both into the kingdom of God, isn't it? Happy days? Are your head's aching? Because I'm going to stop in a minute. I'll stop straight away if your head's are really aching. It's interesting stuff, isn't it? What a great, what a great thing. Okay, a conclusion will be good. Conclusion. Don't ever be afraid of the enemy of souls, because if you're in Christ, we are in the one who is the victor over sin and death and hell. The victor over sin and death and hell. We do not go on the back foot with the forces of darkness. Jesus doesn't, even the disciples don't jump in the boat and go away and leave him to it. As far as we know. Don't go on the back foot. The important thing is to be and to stay in him. See, it's being on the other side that loses you the essential element in your humanity. It's being on the other side that leads you into the grip of the destroyer of souls. It's being on the other side that leads you back to be a, a bond slave again to fear. Faith and fear are opposites. We are on the side that is victorious over sin and death and hell and all its hordes. And these aren't small matters. Don't be surprised either when, when the appearance of God the Son flushes the enemy of souls from out under his little rock. Because Jesus appears and immediately the host of darkness Wah! make a fuss. Yeah? Don't be surprised by that. I had a, a very experienced church planting pastor and, and leader of church planting pastors a little while ago earlier in the year uh, when you sent me to a conference. Thank you very much. Uh, I heard him saying, uh, when it's very, very good, it's very, very bad. And what he was saying is, when God's kingdom is coming forward, you can expect the kingdom of darkness to kick up a stink. Don't be surprised when that happens. What the demons cannot abide, though, is the loving kindness, is the grace of God the Father and the gospel of the kingdom of God. And they pop up their hidden heads. Above everything else, do not be surprised at the enormous power and authority of the incoming kingdom of God and the teaching and the preaching of that gospel. And don't be surprised at the enormous power of Jesus Christ to change unbelievable lives. Unbelievable lives.